Say I have this road map with all the houses, the colors, the dogs, but I'm only interested in the road and these five houses. There is a way to simplify the map by transforming the only two things I need, the houses and the roads, into points and lines. These points are formally called vertices and the lines edges. The diagram that results is called a graph, which will give the name G, you know, for graph. Well, okay, what can we do with this shape? The first thing to understand is not only what is happening visually, but algebraically. The label of each vertex is straightforward. It's V1, V2, V3, etc. But the edge is the connection between the two, labeled as V1, V2, V2, V3, etc. We don't have any other conditions like directions, so it doesn't really matter if we say V1, V2, or V2, V1. The pairs are unordered. This entire construction is known as a simple graph. There are other types of graphs, multi-edge graphs, which have several edges on the same vertices, and there are loops. We won't delve into these, but I will discuss other possibilities. You know how we started with a street and its roads? Well, sometimes these have directions, like single-way streets. There are graphs for that, called digraphs. Much of these revolve around talking about ways of getting from one vertex to another, which is known as walks. In our graph, V1, V2, V5 is a walk of length 2, for example. This walk is also a path, because no vertex appeared more than once. But if we take the walk V1, V4, V2, V3, V4, V5, there is a vertex that repeats twice, so that's not a path. What if I want to round back up to V1? Well, that's a cycle. The more complex versions of these combinations are not random, they have names. See, we have this graph, and we want to visit every vertex, and come back to the original one. That's a Hamilton cycle. But what about this graph? I can indeed walk on every vertex, but I can't return to the initial one and make it a cycle. That is a Hamilton path. Sometimes a graph has neither a Hamilton cycle nor a Hamilton path. All of these paths and crossings sound kind of familiar. And if any of you know what I'm talking about, that's because it reminds us of Euler's Seven Bridges of Konigsberg. You know, where you're supposed to cross the bridges once and only once and get back to the initial vertex. Well, that's something called an Euler Trail. When every edge can be used once and only once. You can even visit the vertices twice. And you don't necessarily need to end up at the point where you started. But you can never visit any edge twice. But what if I want to end up at the same vertex that I started? Like the Konigsberg problem. Well, in that case, that is an Euler tour. The rules stay the same. You have to use the edge only once. And you also have to end up at the same vertex. But there's something else we observe in all of these. What about the number of edges on each vertex? Is there any importance in those? That is called degrees or valency, as preferred by some. Since the word degree has many meanings in mathematics. For example, take the original graph. Vertex 2 has a valency of 4, because 4 edges come out of it. So, what do we do with valencies? What happens if we sum all them up? It might seem to you that the result is like random, but it's not at all. Vertex V1 connects to V2, V3, and V4, so it has degree 3. Continuing this way, we calculate the degrees of each vertex. When we sum these degrees, we get 16. This is known as Euler's handshaking lemma. Handshake because it's usually explained using handshakes. Mathematically, it looks like this. According to the lemma, the sum of the degrees of all vertices is twice the number of the edges. So if we sum the degrees and get 16, this tells us that there must be 8 edges in total. You can verify this by counting the lines in our diagram. This lemma isn't just a neat mathematical trick. It's a fundamental property that helps us understand and verify the structure of any graph. While discussing vertex degrees, it's worth mentioning another interesting area of graph theory called graph coloring, where the goal is to assign colors to vertices so that no two adjacent vertices share the same color. But because of the time constraints, we won't delve into graph coloring. But if you're interested in a video dedicated to it, please let us know in the comment section below. We're always open to any suggestion. And also, do not forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Valences can only be endpoints. I say that because the intersection between V1, V4 and V2, V3 is not a valency or degree. It's just an intersection. That's pretty annoying, right? Well, in order to avoid that, I can change how I visually represent the graph while still keeping it to be technically the same graph. I could take the edge and connect V1 with V4 by going outside. 
What matters is that we maintain the connectivity or preserve its structure. So V1 is still connected to V4 and there are no new connections. The graph is a complete graph. A complete graph on n vertices is denoted as Kn, which is a simple graph in which every pair of distinct vertices is connected by a unique edge. I can also redraw it like this. Now, here's a problem that arises. So of these two, which is K5? Are they both K5? Are they still identical? This can be answered exactly through isomorphisms. For the sake of the explanation, I will use other, much simpler graphs, but the reasoning stays the same. Here are two graphs, G and H. To establish an isomorphism phi between G and H, we need to find a bijection between the vertex sets of G and H, such that the connectivity, the way in which the sets are ordered, is preserved. A bijection is a specific type of function between two sets that is both injective, or one-to-one, -one, and surjective, or on-to. A function f from x to y is injective if different elements in x map to different elements in y. This ensures that each element in x corresponds to a unique element in y, without any overlaps. A function f from x to y is surjective if every element in y is covered by f. This means that for every element in y, there exists at least one element in x such that f of x equals y. This ensures that all elements in y are represented. When a function is both injective and surjective, so a one-to-one -one onto map, it means that every element in the first set maps uniquely each element in the second set and that each element in the second set is mapped by some element in the first one. We can choose to map phi of A to capital A and phi of B to capital B, or we could map phi of A to capital B and phi of B to capital A. In either mapping choice, the single edge between A and B in G corresponds to a single edge between capital A and capital B in H. This is because our mapping ensures that if A is connected to B, then phi of A is connected to phi of B whether phi of A equals capital A and phi of B equals capital B, or the opposite. These isomorphisms show that graphs G and H are structurally identical, or isomorphic, demonstrating that despite different labels or orientations, their underlying graph structure stays the same. Isomorphisms are great for identifying identical graph structures, whatever they may look like visually. But sometimes we don't need such complexity. Sometimes we should opt instead for structures like trees. A tree is a type of graph that is connected and has no cycles. Connected means that you can travel from one vertex to any other through the edges of the tree. No cycles means that there is no path that starts and ends at the same vertex without repeating any edge. Imagine we have a single tree graph T with five vertices arranged as follows. What can we do with it? Well, what happens if we break it apart? Let's remove the edge BC. The new edge set is the following, AB, CD, and DE. Now we have created two separate trees or components, component 1, AB, and component 2, CDE. This collection of two disconnected trees forms what is formally called a forest. Trees can be shaped in all kinds of forms. They just can't have cycles or be connected. Oh, and by the way, what are these little hanging guys that are attached just by one edge? Yeah. They are called leaves. It seems that we just covered everything, right? Not exactly. Let's back up a little bit. Remember our intersection problem? We can redraw the graph to not have that. But sometimes there are just way too many intersections and it becomes way too confusing to rearrange them. So what can we do? We make a planar graph. A graph is defined as planar if it is possible to draw it without any edges intersecting. The rearrangement of the graph so that the edges don't intersect is called a planar embedding. To help figure out where to place what, other than just guessing visually, we use tools like Kuratowski's theorem, which helps us understand whether avoiding intersections is at all possible. The theorem states that a finite graph is planar, or it can be drawn on a plane without any edges crossing, if and only if it does not contain a subgraph that is a subdivision of either the complete graph K5, a graph with five vertices where every pair of vertices is connected by an edge, or the complete bipartite graph K33, a graph with six vertices divided into two sets of three, with every vertex in one set connected to every vertex in the other set, and no connections within a set. If you suspect that a graph is non-planar, you can try to find either a K5 or a K33 subdivision within it. If you find such a subdivision, the graph is definitely not planar. Ah, 
And by the way, there's also something called map coloring to help us figure out these things. If you're interested in knowing more about map coloring, please let us know in the comment section below. This video was inspired by combinatorics by Joy Morris and graph theory by Robin Wilson. If you like this video, I'm pretty sure you're gonna like this one. Go watch it. Check it out.